good line we got by the camera. <laughs> 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 the bottom left screen, the bottom bottom left corner is our our next in line. Yeah.
Hi everyone and welcome to St. Clement's Online Church for this morning. We are so glad that you have joined us and we're really excited um, to learn from God's Word with you this morning. If you are new, um, we're so thankful you're here. We're really excited to meet you and there's no better place to call St. Clement's your home. I'm new. I only started coming here at the beginning of the year and I love being a part of this community. Um, so there's going to be information on the screen throughout. Um, we would love for you to get in contact if you have any questions or would like to just reach out and let us know that you were there um, on the screen this morning. Feel free to put something in the comments. We read them and we would love to hear from you. This morning, there's a few reminders and a few announcements first. Um, so any way that you found this stream, um, near that, there will also be some links for um, three song options. So the first one is um, a little more old school, and then we've got a contemporary version and one for the kids. After this morning's stream, we think it would be great if you spent time with uh, the people that you're in the house with or on your own, just playing that and uh, singing along and having some great time worshiping and praising our God. Also after this, we're going to have um, morning tea, but in an online format. So um, there'll also be a link for Zoom. Um, and if you've never used it before, don't worry, it's super easy. It prompts you the whole way through. Just click on that zinc link, press open Zoom, and then we'll have some time together afterwards and we'll direct you there when we're ready um, to hang out, to chat with the people um, and to see one another. So you have to bring your own morning tea, but um, it will be a really good morning. I'm going to pray for us as we begin this morning. Dear God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather online. We thank you in this weird and unsettling season that we have the constancy of you um, and the comfort that you offer that transcends all understanding of what we are going through. We pray this morning that right now you would be opening our hearts and minds to be molded and shaped by your word. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and we just pray that would be a really helpful time for us uh, for yeah, us to learn more about you and grow in our knowledge and love of you. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, I'm only 26 and I don't want to brag or anything, but I've survived about three ends of the world. There was the first one, which was for me, was only at seven and it was Y2K. And then we had that guy in Alabama who said that he knew the world was going to end. And then only in 2012, we had uh, the Mayan calendar was ending and the world was going to end. And I am not going to lie, each time there's been a little bit of uncertainty for me, um, particularly at the first one, I didn't really know what to do. Um, I didn't know if I should be stockpiling canned veggies that I don't like at the best of times. I didn't know if I should be copying doomsday preppers that were all over weird random TV shows. Um, but today we're going to be thinking about the future and about things like that. And actually we're going to see that Jesus offers us a true comfort, that Jesus is our future and that we don't need to have uncertainty or backup plans or run drills in our houses. We'll see that Jesus is the future. And so Mark will be teaching from that later. But right now, we're going to head into the kids' spot. So we'll see you in a moment. Hi, everyone. I'm back again. Uh, this is my friend Sigrid. I would like to introduce you. This is Sigrid the Sloth. And I've got something really cool about Sigrid. If you haven't noticed, we're kind of matching this morning. We both wore stripes. We didn't really plan that, but we turned up. And I was thinking, we were chatting earlier, and we were thinking, you know what? That happens a lot when you're with friends. See, we both like the color blue, but we liked the color blue before we were friends. And you know, Sigrid really likes country music as well, but she didn't like country music before we were friends. You see, I love country music. And so when we were hanging out, I would play it all the time, just constant, non-stop. And then over time and time and time, Sigrid realized that she loved country music too. I don't know if she actually loves it or if I've just made her love it, but that's really exciting. And sometimes that happens when you're friends with someone, you start to have the same things in common with them. And it's really cool how that happens. And we were chatting earlier and that's exactly like what happens when you are friends with our other best friend, Jesus. How cool is that? You get to be like him. So our friend Jesus, he's the best. Sigrid and I love him. We think he's amazing. And when someone becomes friends with him, they become like him. He helps us to be exactly like him, which is pretty great because he's awesome. You see, he never, ever sins. Not once. Every single time he picks 
God's way. He picks to follow God, to listen to God, to do what God says. And every single time, it's the right thing to do. And, you know, sometimes Sigrid and I, you know, we don't always pick God's way. And that can be really hard. But Jesus always does. And so when you're friends with Jesus, he helps you to do the same thing. So Jesus loves caring for other people. And so Sigrid and I tried really, really hard to care for other people. And Jesus is really patient. He always has his listening ears on and he's really slow to become angry with people. And so Sigrid has a bit of a temper, but she's working really, really hard at not being angry at people. And Jesus always makes time for God. He takes time away to hang out, to pray and Sigrid and I are trying really hard to do that and to pick a time to do that. Sigrid likes getting up early, so she does hers in the morning. I'm not so much of a morning person, so I pray and read the Bible at night. But these are just three ways that you can be like Jesus. And you see in Romans 8.29, now and in the future, it tells us that we're going to be like Jesus. So I'm going to read from that now. It says, God planned that those he had chosen would become like his son. In that way, Christ will be the first and most honoured amongst brothers and sisters. Did you hear that? God planned that those who were chosen would become like his son. You see, now and in the future, we're going to become like Jesus. And so there are three ways you can work on caring for others, being patient and making time for God. They're just three ways you can be like God this week. But you know what? There's some really cool news and Sigrid knows the news and she told me about this morning. When we try to be like Jesus now, we're never going to be exactly like him, even though God really helps us. But Jesus promises that one day we will be. One day when we're becoming more and more like Jesus every day now, the longer you're friends with him, the more like him you become, but we'll never be exactly like him on earth because sin is still here. So so Sigrid's going to take some time out. I'm going to show you. See, some of us have asthma, and so sometimes that makes it a little bit hard to breathe, and some of us need to wear glasses. Some of us have sore ankles, and so we need to wear strapping tape while we're playing sports. And so that shows us that there is still sin, no matter how much we might become, be becoming like God and we can become, um, we can listen and pray and be patient and all those things will make us more like Jesus. But there are actually times where our bodies aren't 100% okay. For me, mine has a weird balance of chemicals and so I've got to take some medication to help balance that out to make sure that, um, yeah, that I don't find it too hard to be happy or stressed or that uh, I can process my food properly. You see, all of us, we get sad sometimes, all of us, we get sick sometimes, and all of us get hurt sometimes. And these three things show us that we'll be more like Jesus every day, but we won't be exactly like him right now. But Revelation tells us something super, super cool. So I'm going to read from that now. And it says, This is talking about when Jesus comes back and he's going to come back and take us to live with him in heaven. And this is someone telling us what that looks like. His name is John. And John says, I heard a loud voice from the throne. It said, look, God now makes his home with the people. He will live with him. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And how cool is this part? It says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sadness. There'll be no more crying or pain. Things are no longer the way they used to be. You see, there are going to be times here where we look a lot like Jesus. And that's really, really cool because God helps us to look like him now. But we're going to be exactly like him in the future because Jesus come back and get us. So it means now you might get sick sometimes, but you're not going to get sick anymore in heaven. And then... There might be times that you're sad and there will be times that you're sad here. But same thing, I'm getting better at tearing them closer to the middle. There's going to be no more crying and there'll be no more reason to cry. And then lastly, you might get sore. And in heaven, when we're exactly like that, we'll have bodies that can't get sore, that can't get sick and that can't get sad because we won't need to. You see, we're friends with Jesus. And so each day we can work to become more like him now. 
But in the future, Jesus is going to fix it all so that there's absolutely no sin. And I think that's pretty cool. I'm pretty excited for that. Sigrid's pretty excited for that. I think you guys should be excited for that. So right now while we're waiting till we have no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain, we should be focusing on what we can do to be more like Jesus this week. So for me, I'm going to work on listening to people before I start talking when I call them up. I wonder what you're going to do. I'm going to pray for us now and we're going to learn. Dear God, thank you so much that we get to do things that make us like your son now and that you help us to do that. We pray that we'll be learning to be patient, learning to listen, and that we would be good at spending time with you. Lord, help us to do these things and be more like your son. Thank you, though, that you have an ultimate plan and so that our bodies will be exactly like Jesus's is in heaven and we'll have a time where there is no more crying, no more sickness, and no more pain. Amen. We're now going to read the Bible, so um, I would love for you to join us while we do that. The first reading is from John 5, 16 to 30. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them the, his answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honour the son just as they honour the father. He who does not honour the son does not honour the father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, for a time, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given authority to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 58. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed because of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. 
If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so are also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the unperishable, imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the, clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my, brother, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're going to hear Mark teach from these passages now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Your first thought is probably, where are you, Mark? Uh, It doesn't look like church. Well, this is very true. I'm actually uh, preaching this morning from my bedroom. Uh, The reason why I'm in my bedroom is because on Friday morning, I woke up with a sore throat. Uh, Of course, a sore throat is one of the symptoms of COVID-19. I was referred by the doctor for testing and I've been placed in self-isolation. Uh, And hopefully I get a negative result on Monday and I can resume normal business. Uh, But if not, I'll be stuck in here for quite a while yet. But anyway, thanks to modern technology, I'm able to share God's word with you today. Now, it's interesting. I tried everything possible to make sure that I would not get COVID-19. I followed all the different instructions that we've been given. I was very careful with social isolation. I was uh, very careful with hygiene and and all those sorts of things. Yet, we cannot control the future. We cannot control uh, what will happen to us. And one of the reasons why we can worry in life is because of our lack of control over the future, because of the uncertainty that the future brings for each and every one of us. Indeed, our government is trying its best to stop the spread of COVID-19 But as our Prime Minister said the other day, uh, they can do all they can, but COVID-19 writes its own rules. Uh, So we cannot control the future. Now, there are two things in life that we are told are certainties. Death and taxes. Now, to that list today, I want to add one other item, and that is Jesus. Indeed, I want to suggest to you that the Bible teaches us that Jesus is the future. Jesus is the future. How is he the future? Well, I want to suggest to you two ways, two ways that the Bible speaks about that show that Jesus is the future, that we can be certain uh, of seeing him in the future. Uh, The first uh, way in which Jesus is the future is this. We will all face Jesus in the future And he will determine where we will spend eternity. So we're all going to face him. And he is the one who is going to determine where we will spend eternity. Uh, Let me read to you from John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23a. It says, Moreover, the Father 
judges no one, but has trusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. So Jesus is very clear that he is the Son, uh, and he is saying here that God the Father has entrusted him with all judgment. Uh, the Bible is very clear. Humanity dies once and after that faces judgment. And Jesus is saying that he is the judge that we will all stand before in the future. He is the judge that we're all going to have to give an account of ourselves to. Now, why is Jesus going to be the judge? Well, there's a couple of reasons that he spells out here in John 5. Uh, he talks about that God the Father makes him the judge so that he, Jesus, might receive honour just as God receives honour. Uh, for those of you who have tuned into our recent series, Jesus is Not Fake News, uh, you would have heard that Jesus made the claim that he is the only way to have eternal life with God because he is the truth about God and the source of all life. Uh, indeed, in this particular passage, Jesus uh, makes it very clear that he works on the Sabbath because his father works. Uh, what he does is what his father does. Uh, and through his words and through his deeds, Jesus reveals God. Indeed, uh, the religious leaders in John 5 weren't very happy with Jesus because they believed that he was claiming to be equal with God. Well, he is equal with God the Father because he is God the Son. And the reason why he will judge all people is so that he might be honoured just as the Father is honoured. But there's another reason why Jesus is going to be the judge on the final day. Uh, John 5, 27, Jesus says, And he, referring to God the Father, has given him, referring to himself, authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Jesus is going to be the judge because he is the Son of Man. Uh, what, what does that mean? What's the significance of that? Well, this is referring back to an Old Testament passage in the book of Daniel. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, we read these words. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Uh, here is a prophecy hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus, speaking about one like a son of man who comes to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is God the Father, and who receives from God the Father all authority and glory and sovereign power, who will rule forever. And Jesus is saying in John's gospel, he is that son of man. He is this one that Daniel 7 spoke about who will rule forever. And part of his ruling over all forever is that he will bring all into judgment. Friends, Jesus is the future because he is the one that we will all face. He is the one who will judge us. Now, on what basis will Jesus judge us. Well, Jesus speaks about this in John chapter 5, verses 23b to 24, where he says, he who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Here we are told that if we do not honour the Son, we do not honour God the Father. If we don't uh, accept Jesus for who he is and depend upon him, we bring dishonour to the Father. Indeed, that's one of the problems with the Islamic faith. They don't honour the Son as he deserves to be honoured. Uh, they see that Jesus is just a messenger of God. 
not the message, not the truth about God. Uh, they don't in any way see him as being equal with God the Father. And so Islam dishonors Jesus in that respect. But friends, anyone who refuses to have Jesus as king over their lives brings dishonor to the Son and thus dishonor to the Father. And so if you have been found to have dishonored Jesus by failing to have him as your king, by failing to live his way, then you will be condemned by the judgment that Jesus will bring. Now, the truth of the matter is that we all deserve that condemnation, for none of us has honoured the Son and honoured his Father as they deserve. But there is a possibility for us to escape that condemnation at the judgment. And Jesus spells that out in verse 24. Let me read it to you again. He says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. As I talked about over the Easter weekend, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus died upon a cross to take all the punishment that we deserve so that we might not have to take it. And what Jesus says here is that if we believe in all that God the Father has done by sending Jesus into the world, and it's not just acknowledging that it happened, but if we respond with wholehearted dependence upon God, if we respond with a desperate plea seeking forgiveness from God, believing all that Jesus has done, then we will have eternal life. To kind of boil everything I've just said sort of right down, basically what Jesus is saying is this. If we reject him now and his authority over us and his offer of eternal life, if we reject him now, he will reject us at the time of judgment and we will be condemned. However, if we accept him now, if we accept that he really is equal with God, if we accept that he really did die in our place and took the punishment we deserve, if we accept that he is the source of life who can raise us from the dead and we commit ourselves to honour him and to live for him, then we will have eternal life. So Jesus is the future. And how we respond to him now will determine how he will respond to us when we face him in judgment. We will all face Jesus in judgment, and he is the one who determines where we will spend eternity. And so I urge you, please, please accept Jesus now if you have not already. For those who reject him will be rejected by him, but those who accept him will be accepted by him and have eternal life. So Jesus is the future in the sense that we will all face him and our eternal futures will be determined by him. But secondly, Jesus is the future in this sense, in that his resurrection is the template for his followers' future. Jesus' resurrection is the template for his followers' future. Now, a, a template is sort of a, a, an original prototype, if you like, from which other models are then sort of created. What we are told, particularly in 1 Corinthians 15, is that when it comes to what we will be like when we have eternal life with Jesus, with God, well, Jesus' resurrection is the template. Uh, we are told that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so too we who are dead will be raised like him. Uh, those of us who are still alive when he returns will be transformed in an instant to be like Jesus. Indeed, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, we read this, And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Uh, if you trust in Jesus, well, in the future, you will be like him. You will be like him. Uh, just as he was raised from the dead, so too you will be raised from the dead and you will be like him. And what does it mean to be like Jesus? 
Well, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 to 43 spells it out. It says, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Uh, friends, when the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, yes, there was continuity uh, between who he was before he died and what he was like after he died, but there were changes too. Uh, he was raised imperishable. Uh, no longer could death ever claim Jesus or sickness or anything else for that matter. He was raised glorious. Uh, indeed, we see at the start of the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus in all of his glory appears before one of his disciples, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, John tells us. And when John sees Jesus in all his glory, he falls down as if dead. So startled he is, so amazed he is by how glorious Jesus is. Well, we will be glorious in that sense like Jesus too. And we're also told that uh, the resurrection body is powerful, imperishable, glorious, powerful. That's what Jesus is like. And if we follow Jesus, we too will be like that for all of eternity. You see, his resurrection is the template for those who follow him. Just as Jesus was raised in an imperishable, glorious, powerful body, so too will we who trust in him. Death will not claim us. COVID-19 will certainly not claim us. Uh, because we are glorious, we will be free from any sin or corruption. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful hope. So friends, Jesus is the future in the sense that we're all going to face him and he is going to determine where we will spend eternity. But he is the future also in the sense for us as his followers, he is the template. His resurrection is the template which we will follow. Just as he was raised, imperishable, glorious, powerful, so too, we will be raised in that way. Jesus is the future. But Jesus being the future also has an impact upon life for us now. So obviously, uh, we need to make sure that we have accepted Jesus as our king. So that's the first thing we've got to do. But what we see also is that Jesus being the future means that our work for him now is not in vain. So Jesus being the future means that our work for him now is not in vain. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, we read, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So the Apostle Paul of 1 Corinthians 15 has been talking about the resurrection from the dead and what we'll be like. And now he says, in light of the victory that we have in Jesus, we are to make sure now that we are working hard in service of the Lord, working hard to help people become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, helping people to grow in maturity as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to use the different gifts that God has given to us to bring about that work of God. Now, we might suffer for doing that work, just as Jesus suffered. Uh, we might even die for the sake of that work. But you know what? That work will not be in vain because death has been defeated. Jesus is the future. He is the one who will rule over all. And so as we do his work now, even if it seems in vain, even if it ends in death, well, the Lord's work is never in vain because Jesus is victorious. He is the future. He is the one who controls the future. Indeed, he controls everything now. He's sovereign. So knowing that Jesus is the future, knowing that people are going to face him in judgment, well, we really, really need to make sure we are helping others to come to know Jesus. And knowing that we will all face Jesus in judgment and we'll all be called to give an account for how we have served him, well, we really need to devote ourselves now to helping others grow in Christian maturity so that they are indeed acting in ways that are pleasing to Christ. So Jesus is the future. He is the one that we will all face. He is the one who will determine our eternal destiny. 
For those of us who follow him, his resurrection is the template which we will follow. Uh, we will be raised just as Jesus was raised. And all of this means that we are now to work hard doing the work of the Lord, helping people come to faith, helping people grow in faith, knowing that whatever happens, that work will never, ever be in vain. Praise God that Jesus is the future. Praise God for the comfort that comes with knowing that Jesus is the future, knowing that he has conquered death and that death no longer has power over us. Praise God. Amen. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just about to head into an interview that Mark did with Gary Koo, who is our new bishop this week, which is really exciting. We just want to give you a quick disclaimer. Uh, Gary's audio was really good quality, but his video wasn't 100%. And so it jumps around a little bit. Don't stress that your computer is suddenly freaking out. Um, it's actually just the video. Um, but I think he has some really exciting and awesome things to say. So we're going to hear that now and then we're going to pray together. Bishop Gary Koo, it's uh, wonderful to have you joining us at St. Clement's Online Church. It's a big welcome to you. Good day, St. Clement's. Good to see you all. Uh, now, Gary, my guess is that many people in the St. Clement's family really won't know very much about you, if anything at all. So would you mind giving us a bit of an overview of the Gary Koo story to this point? I'd love to, and um, I'm sorry I haven't been able to come and visit you at St. Clement's, but, you know, circumstances have uh, made it a bit difficult. But uh, we'll, we'll come and visit and spend time with you, meet you face-to-face -face soon, I hope, uh, the Lord willing. So my story, um, born in Australia, parents uh, migrated from Malaysia, grew up in the western suburbs and uh, uh, went to Ermington Public School, uh, when there were very few Asian people around that area, and uh, typical migrant kid, uh, worked hard, studied hard, uh, ended up you know, studying medicine at Sydney University, but wasn't a Christian. Uh, but the real turning point was um, when my mother, around halfway through my medical degree, developed cancer. Um, and it, it developed very quickly, and she ended up dying from that. I watched her die. I watched her take a last breath. Now, I was an atheist from conviction, uh, from a young kid. I couldn't see God didn't think he made a difference, therefore there was no God. But as I watched my mother die, I came to realize that uh, my whole system was flawed, that I shouldn't really care about my mother dying because it's just natural, uh, that it's just chemical reactions, but I did care. And I thought, well, there's something inconsistent with my worldview. And then what happened was a whole series of so-called coincidences. They're never coincidences, God is sovereign. Uh, but I was... Uh, at university one day before there were smartphones and before there were mobile phones and uh, I couldn't find my friends I had no choice but to pull out a textbook which I hadn't done in the first three years and um, some people were doing what's called library learning or cold contact evangelism from a group called student life and they came up to me and asked me if I wanted to talk about Jesus now beginning of that day I had no interest in Jesus whatsoever but given the choice between talking about Jesus and studying I said, yes, I'll talk about Jesus. And uh, what I discovered was that being a Christian wasn't about being better than other people or about following a moral code, but being a Christian was about having Jesus at the center of your life, which I'd never realized. Now, I just happened to be working at Grace Brothers, now known as Maya, selling televisions, with a Christian bloke who happened to know these people from Student Life who came to talk to me, a guy called Matthew Hunt, who's a Baptist minister up in Queensland now. And I told him about this encounter and he invited me to do something called Christianity Explained. And I just happened to have a Bible from a friend who wasn't using it anymore. And he, he encouraged me to read the first two chapter of, chapters of Mark's gospel in preparation. So I did. I read the first chapter, the second chapter, third, fourth. I read all 16 chapters that night and I was blown away because the Jesus I expected to meet there uh i expected it to be myth and fairy tales right like a children's story but the jesus i met was real was compelling was powerful was authentic and i, I was really quite shocked i i think i realized at that point i'd got it wrong and i may even have become a christian just by reading the bible that night so that's how i became a christian 
one thing led to another, started going to church, I uh, was encouraged to think about ministry. Um, grace really struck me, the whole idea that uh, of God's generosity. I, being a kid, had always worked for everything, but here was, um, some, was a message telling me that you could have everything for nothing because God had paid the price. Best news in the world. Wanted to tell everyone about that. Uh, end up going, doing MTS at New South University. Uh, went to Moore College where I remember going library lawning with Alison. I don't know if she remembers that. She does. Year. She does. <laughs> and uh, end up uh, at a Chinese church to begin with and then at St. Paul's Carlingford after that. Married to Pearl. Have two kids, Thomas and Annabelle, who are 17 and 15 and very different. <laughs> So that's my story. What a great story and uh, praise God for the way in which he worked uh, and continues to work in your life. Um, so at the start of February, you became the Bishop uh, of the Western Region. So moved from being the Rector of uh, Carlingford to that role. Uh, how's life been since you became a Bishop? Well, it hasn't quite worked out the way I thought it would. I thought I'd take my time. I get to meet people, visit churches. I was going to come out with Stephen Quo and visit you guys and you know talk about Anglicare or I had these had my calendar filled out I was going to do confirmations I had all these things lined up and hasn't quite worked out the way I thought so I mean uh it's been good in some ways because um I guess whenever you're in a new role you're trying to find your feet but God hasn't given me that option he said you just got to go so I've had to go and uh actually in God's timing you know I'm I, I'm medically trained and I've come into the team at this time where we're dealing with COVID-19. So I think God's good timing. I was well placed to be able to support the archbishop uh, in him leading the diocese through this crisis. So yeah, it's been, it's been different, but I guess it's actually accelerated my contact with people, especially uh, the rectors in the West and yeah, helped me fit in as part of the team because I had no choice. <laughs> And, you know, isn't, isn't God wonderful in the way in which he brings uh, people to the fore at different points who have different skills? So, you know, your medical background has, has really been something that God's been able to use at this point. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's, um, people have asked me, have I regretted um, training as a doctor? No, no. I mean, I think it doesn't matter what training you've had, what background you've had, God can, God, God can use that to serve uh, him and his people in, in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Now, Gary, uh, it's, it's really easy at a time such as this for people to be focused on things that they're missing out on. Uh, I know a lot of people are really sad at the moment not to be able to, say, be at church, uh, meeting up with others. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to encourage people to do is, is to focus on the opportunities that exist, but also things that we can be thankful for at a time such as, like, as this. What are you particularly thankful for at this time? Well, I think... <laughs> fact that people miss church i'm kind of thankful for that sounds like a funny thing to say but i think we just took church very much for granted just turning up every week year after year just seeing the same people or church is precious church is special i think i'm really thankful for the fact that god's made it really obvious to people at the moment you know church is so special it's such a wonderful thing such a wonderful expression of the reality of the fact that we're all the body of christ and we've been joined to the lord jesus so i think that's been wonderful just even though we're apart, I think relationships have been strengthened. I think pastoral care has been strengthened. I think more people have been contacting each other than ever before. And I'd love to see us keep doing this on the other side. Um, I guess I'm also thankful. I mean, look, let me get, let me get this straight. Like what's happening with, with COVID-19 is terrible. So don't get me wrong about that. But in a way, it's been good for our message, just in terms of the fact it's reminded people that even though we've Australia is a relative paradise, you know, without war, wealthy, lovely climate, we're still mortal, that one day we will die. And the other thing is that despite our wealth and technology, we're still limited. There are things that we can't fix, things that we can't control. So it just, it, it leads us like in Luke chapter 13, you know, where Jesus talks about the Tower of Siloam and those who pilot, whose blood pilot mixed with their sacrifices. When we see disaster, when we see tragedy, when we see the effects of the fall, uh, what should we do? We should repent. We should, we should turn back to God and cling on to God uh, and, and, you know, and hold on to his promises and hold on to everything he says. So I think there's a sense that I'm thankful for being a Christian at this time. 
And I can't imagine what it'd be like not to be a Christian at this time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, final question for you, Gary. Uh, is there any particular message that you'd like to uh, pass on to the, the good people at St. Clement's at this time? Uh, can I say that in, in a strange way, uh, St. Clement's is more accessible to your friends and family and your neighbours than ever before. Uh, one of the things I didn't quite realise was how difficult, I think I did realise this, but uh, how difficult it is for people to walk through the doors of a church and have to talk to people. They don't have to walk out of their lounge room now to come to church with you and, and see what it's like. So what's the worst thing that can happen when you, you know, if, if you invite a friend to drop in on a service and join you and interact with them? This is the most accessible church has ever been. So God had to close the doors of our churches to open the doors to people's lounge rooms. So I think I'd, I'd like to encourage you to have a go. Absolutely. And, and I must say, uh, I, I've marvelled um, hearing about people from countries overseas who have been watching what we've been doing. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's certainly been a wonderful sort of blessing through all of this. But uh, Bishop Gary Koo, thank you for taking time out to uh, be with us at St. Clement's Online Church. And we will certainly be praying for you as you continue in your ministry serving us here in the Western region. Thanks again for being with us. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, St. Clements. See you soon. We're going to pray together now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now, Lord, in a time of prayer. We thank you for the sure hope we reflected on over Easter of Jesus' death and resurrection. And we give you thanks and praise that we can rest in the knowledge that Jesus is our future and that our work for him now is not in vain. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We pray for our governments and their advisers as they continue to make important decisions for the care of our society. We pray you would give them great wisdom as they navigate the next steps forward and as they make decisions about what will happen now that the curve of infections is flattening. Grant us as a nation patience and obedience as we support and adhere to the directives of our leaders. We thank you for the clear and wise leadership of our diocesan leaders in the Anglican Church in Sydney at this time and for Gary Koo as Bishop of our region. We pray that you would continue to strengthen and guide them as they make decisions for the broader church and as they support the ongoing ministries in the diocese. We pray that despite the obvious restrictions, that this would be a time of growth and renewal in church members and the spread of your gospel into the world. May we all continue to work for your praise and glory. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, we have had a really good morning. Um, a few reminders before we finish up. Uh, the songs will be, um, the links to the songs are there. So really spend some time this morning, especially if you have been missing um, singing together, um, watching those videos and singing along to those songs. Uh, the other thing is if you have kids who did the kids' activities, on the last page there are a few questions um, that would be really cool if you guys sat down as a family and chatted about and thought about, um, yeah, for your family this week to help those kids with um, their learning from the Bible this morning.
And we're just about to head to morning tea. Uh, yeah, if you haven't joined us for morning tea before, um, we all kind of jump in and then we are assigned a random breakout room, which it automatically takes you to. And you just get a couple of people uh, that you get to chat with. And my, the missional community I'm in, the young adult one, we've said that this is something we're actually really thankful for. Um, it's meant that we've chatted to people that we might not have chatted to normally on a Sunday and we've got to know people better. So um, I'd really encourage you to join us for that. It's a really beautiful blessing in this time to chat with new people. But this morning we've learned that Jesus is the future. Not only will we stand before him, but that we will be like him in the future. Um, I was really challenged from that um, sermon and from the passages in one John, uh, in John and one Corinthians, to think about: Am I responding to God and am I responding to Jesus with an eternal perspective? I think sometimes I get too caught up on um, what's happening tomorrow or what's happening next week, and I haven't really considered how my actions have eternal consequences, and also um, that there is an eternal perspective that we can have. So I was thinking, um, yeah, how can I give myself fully to the work of the Lord this week? And I decided I'm going to write out um, verse 55 and put that on the back of my door so that I see it um, every time I'm thinking about going somewhere, just so that as I do that every day, I'm challenged and I'm reminded of uh, an eternal perspective. And it would be really cool if you thought about something that you can do this week to remember, um, yeah, an eternal perspective. And in even in the uh, morning tea breakout rooms, if you guys ask yourselves the question and ask each other, how can I give myself fully to the work of the Lord this week with an eternal perspective? Before we finish, I'm going to say the grace. Um, so the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. We are excited to see you. Oh, amen. We're excited to see you um, this week in the stream. We would love for you to continue joining us and we'll see you next week and we'll see you in morning tea in just a second. We'll see you then.